Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, here once again on Sackville Street, Piccadilly, where the construction continues. I'm here to visit Henry Southern Limited, the illustrious a purveyor of rare and collectible books and prints, and a firm that has been in business since 1761, and from these premises since 1936. Situated right next door to our good friends at Kent Haste and Lactor, I have often passed Southern's intriguing shop front, replete with its beautiful leather-bound books and richly engraved prints. But amazingly, I never once took the initiative just to enter and investigate further these treasures that are seemingly hidden in plain sight. Originally founded in the year 1761, quite some distance north of London, in the historic cathedral city of York, Southerns first came to prominence as the purchaser in 1768 of the library of Lawrence Stern, the celebrated satirist and author of The Life and Opinions of Trisham Shandy Gentleman. Other famous libraries subsequently purchased by Southerns include that of Charles Dickens in 1870 and the Althrop Library in 1892. Southerns is renowned not only for its unique yet varied stock, but also for its wonderfully warm, relaxed, and welcoming atmosphere where connoisseurs of prints and books are always to be found here browsing the shelves to seek out a particular prize volume or examining the spectacular array of prints available from Vanity Fair and antique Japanese through military and maritime, all the way to an incredible selection of vintage luggage labels. Today, I'm excited to have been invited to take a closer look at the fascinating history of this venerable institution by none other than Chris Saunders, the managing director. So join me as we step inside and brace yourselves for an intimate exploration of the timeless world of quality craftsmanship and tradition as so vibrantly represented here at Southern's Fine Books and Prints. Chris. Hey there. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Very welcome. And, nice uh, to meet you. You know, it's an honor to finally be able to step through these doors. I mean, as I described when we spoke on the phone, I, sure. you know, I've walked past this beautiful shop and your shop window on so many occasions on my way to uh, my tailor, you know, Ken Haste. I'm wearing one of their beautiful creations Lovely, today. Yeah. Uh, and just like so many places in London, there's these incredible shops that have just kind of been quietly, you know, going about their, <laughs> you know, their work all over the place that you never have a chance to pop into. So sure. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for coming in. You're very welcome. <laughs> so how long has Southern's been around? I mean, it's, it's a historic company. But... Yeah, well, we were founded in 1761 up in uh, York. Uh, recently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, moved down to London in 1815. And we've been in this kind of area ever since. But mm -hmm. We've been in this building since 1936 really? when it was built. Okay. We were the first people in. Talk to me a little bit about kind of how the business is organized, because I would imagine, you know, again, like, so much there's more than meets the eye. Sure, I mean, well, actually when we started off, we specialized in books, prints, and wine, but the wine part of the business dropped off. Um, <laughs> but we have long been interested in building collections of people mm -hmm. and dealing with libraries. So we dealt with people like Charles Dickens Library when he died, and we've mm -hmm. helped some of the big libraries in America with, with some of their big holdings. And we also, uh, you know, ordinary people off the street might come in and see something beautiful. So we want to have lovely things for passers-by as well as for serious collectors. Mm -hmm. And so we've always been looking at the rare and the fine and the unusual. Mm -hmm. And this is not just books, it's also posters and prints that you can put up on your wall. So yeah. we deal with the decorative and the sort of the intellectual at the same time. Wow, I mean, it's really incredible. I mean, there's so much I already see on the shelves I'd love to pull. Well, we've already pulled some things out uh, for you, really? actually. So if you'd like to come downstairs, I'll show you what we've got. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Oh, wow. It's 
beautiful down here. Thank you very much. Ah, well, I'm so excited to see what you've pulled. I mean, everything's so interesting down here. I mean, you could get lost. <laughs> some people do. Uh, but I've sort of made things easier for you by, by making some choices. Uh, I understand you've just been to Dukes, yeah. talking about martinis yes, and James Bond. Yeah, Alessandro, good friend of mine. Great, great martini. Good, but I mean, he might appreciate this in that case. We have here a first edition of Thunderball, one of the great James Bond uh, novels. A lovely, lovely, rich chopping dust wrapper, which you have to have if you're going to have a collectible Ian Fleming. Wow. Um, that's mm. a first edition from 1961, and it's in lovely condition, yeah. about 1,250 pounds. Really? So doesn't break the bank. That's Earlier amazing. Bonds can do, but you know, <laughs> he was a very popular character by the time they produced this one. Yeah. Even so, yeah. I mean, what a wonderful thing to have. Well, he was alive. prolific and, uh, you know, I mean, he was a product of Mayfair. Right? He and was indeed. In and around this area where the streets he, he uh, yeah. you know, frequented. So, I mean, he's a very Southerns author because we're also in the middle of Mayfair, mm -hmm. uh, just around the corner from places like Dukes, uh, where yeah. you might, drink something that comes in a container like that. <laughs> and what this is, a, a, another strand of what we do at Southern mm -hmm. is interesting, off the beaten track, maybe not even really a book, but it's a printed item. And what this is, is printed in aluminium, to like a cocktail mm -hmm. shaker, and its content is a version of the night before Christmas, but written during the Prohibition era. So in this case, Father Christmas turns up and his sack is full of booze and everybody gets very merry, very merry and have <laughs> a lovely right. Christmas. But unfortunately an illegal one. Hmm. And so were these, you know, cocktail, um, they weren't cocktail recipes, it's just more of a... I mean, this was produced as a, really as almost like a extravagant Christmas card for the people who were sort of the friends of the press of the Woolly Whale who, mm -hmm. who made this. So this is really a very, very limited, not ever sold on the market. Um, there are only a couple in existence in the world, uh, hence it's 3,000 pounds, but it's yeah. just such an interesting little item. It's yeah. so quirky. And it's beautifully printed. I mean, 1932, it really shows yeah, yeah. And what printed, they were doing. Printed on aluminium, which is not an easy thing to print on. So yeah, yeah. lovely little thing. Wow. What's so incredible about a shop like this is the variety, mm. right? I mean, you've got, of course, you know, famous works of literature, mm -hmm. right? But also beautiful illustrations. Yeah, as, and obviously those are 20th century things, but this is from the 19th century, the kind of the golden age of British wow. exploration. I mean, look at the printing alone. Yeah, I mean, the marbled, mm. marbled end papers actually are a really big thing. People love these things. Yeah. And you can see why, because I mean, that's some crazy design. But this is all about the wow. illustration. So it's views of the interior of Guiana. Um, it has these most amazing, as you can see, wow! Sort of hand-coloured, and plates. these would have been printed on a, as lithograph, and then, then hand-coloured. So some some <coughs> unknown artists, because these people weren't paid very much, yeah. and they were usually either art students or sometimes sort of talented women artists, mm -hmm. would be given plates by these by the hundreds to sit and and colour, and they did the most incredible jobs. I mean, look at the colouring on that that headdress. Is the, it watercolour or coloured yeah, pencil? Yeah, yeah, no, it's watercolour, and you get these beautiful um, hand-coloured lithographs. It's wow, amazing. The moonlight, you know, the the details of the colour on the water and the mountain and the headdresses. Um, and these were these were not cheap to produce. So these yeah. were at the time these are lavish productions. And now this retails for around six thousand pounds. But yeah. considering the artwork you get inside it, yeah. it's incredible. I mean, what's incredible to me about something like this is your connection to just the thread of time. Yeah. Because back in the nineteenth century, I mean, the only way anyone would see this area of the world is through a work exactly. like this from someone who traveled there and actually. Yeah. you know, drew these and then reproduced them. And this is why the detail is so important because otherwise how would you know that a little bird might yeah. sit on the top of a pole like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is better than photography in yeah. many ways because really? it's kind of the, the, the distilled essence of the place that they're traveling to. And you have the, the story to accompany it. Yeah, I mean, this is also, I mean, Guyana was a not very heavily explored place at mm -hmm. this point. So the, the narrative is quite fun because he's seeing things that Westerners hadn't really seen before. Yeah. So yeah, you get this real kind of sense of excitement of the new, mm. Yeah, but it's 200 years ago. Yeah, so. I mean, you think of the, you know, the British Empire, yeah. you know, in that era, in the, you know, the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, we're really at the cutting edge of exploration. Sure. That it, I guess it makes only sense that that's reflected in the books that were being printed here. Sure. 
as those experiences were being disseminated kind of across the world. Yeah, and it's something that we deal with a lot here. 19th century sort of British exploration mm -hmm. is a very popular um, subject for us. And obviously our imperial past is, you know, increasingly discussed and interesting yeah. to, to historians and general readers. But, but also they did produce some really beautiful things. Yeah. I mean, the colonial period lasts up to the present day. I mean, I know you're interested in the Prince of Wales. Yeah, he that was famed, fine dresser. An iconic dresser. Um, but he was also, at one point, due to become the Emperor of India. Um, that's what these two books are about. It's, it's a two volume work celebrating a tour that he and his entourage mm. took to India in 1923. Uh, it's the most incredibly detailed travelogue but what's most interesting about it really is the binding, the presentation. Yeah. So these books were produced in India. Which is, I'll, I'll let you do the honors. <laughs> <laughs> which is also very unusual. Um, but the two come together. They're both obviously in velvet. Wow. And look at the richness of the velvet. I mean, different know, colors, the blue yeah. and the uh, purple. With the, this kind of metal inlay um, label. I mean, it's all a very unusual presentation. This is a super rare thing because it was produced not really for sale, it was it was for presentation, and it is an incredibly detailed account of this actually quite short trip. Hmm. But it was important because it was assumed that he would, in the not too distant future, take it over as emperor. So, you know, our 19th, 18th, 19th century colonial history comes right up until the 20th century. Well, and again, what what a great illustration as well of just how important the Prince of Wales was at that time. Yeah. You know, to uh, the British Empire, right? And, you know, a place like India. Yeah. This that they is... would have gone to the trouble even to put something like this together, documenting his trip. I mean, this is a work, uh, a time of diplomacy, really. This is why he <clears throat> went there, is this to forge the bond with the, with the empire. Um, and yes, times have changed. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, transcriptions of all his speeches. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the detail is incredible. Um, there's also some great uh, photographs. I wonder if we could find, there's a lovely picture of the Prince of Wales in his sort of imperial garb. There we go. There he is, Edward VIII, as he would have been as, as emperor. Amazing. Oh gosh. And again, I mean, look at the beautiful binding. I mean, this is yeah. just as much a part of how a book is a work of art. Yeah. You know, as the writing and illustrations. As, as book collectors see it, I mean, that's very much um, a part of the joy of books. I mean, obviously you get the content and the joy of reading it, but you also get the joy of the, the physical object. So wow. the, as beautiful as it gets. We do have um, a little bit of royal stuff. Certainly now this book here um, is much earlier than anything else we've looked at so far. This is uh, from 1600. <laughs> the first edition in English of Livy's History of Rome. Okay. Um, which is an important book in itself because- <laughs> Exactly, yeah, 1600. 1600. Um, it was published in the time of uh, Queen Elizabeth. Hence, there's this lovely picture of <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> She's lovely. Isn't she? <laughs> um, but what's important about this particular copy is that we think it came from the library of Prince Frederick, who was James I, Prince of Wales. Mm. Um, he would have become king had he not died aged 18 of typhus. Mm. Instead of him, it, it became Charles I, and that ended kind of disastrously. But Frederick was um, very different. He was very scholarly. So he, although he died at the age of 18, he'd built up a library of about a thousand volumes, mm. took it very seriously. Mm. And why is it do you think that this would have been from his library? Because there's this crest printed at the corners which is present on books from his library. Now, his yeah. library was dispersed you know, centuries ago. Mm -hmm. So books of his do um, appear every now and again. Wow. And uh, this would be the perfect book for a prince's library because it's all about statecraft and politics and the art of being a king. So yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. And it's a mere 18,000 pounds for a piece of history like that. It's, I mean, it's staggering to just consider the amount of work yeah. that would have gone into the production of a volume like this well, especially at that time. Yeah, I mean, the early stages of the printing press. Yeah, and you look at the, the quality of things like the, the printed frontis, uh, type of page, you know, the beauty of this very fine type. Yeah, it, it's an astonishing piece of work, it really is.
Hmm. Wow. Coming back to things to do with, with British colonialism, I mean, the last thing I've really got to show you on that is uh, this rather incredible photo album, which is something else we like because these are really unique. I mean, these are unpublished pictures. Uh, we don't know the person who took them, but he was clearly a British civil servant living yeah. in the Raj between the wars. Look at that dagger skin. Going out on hunts. So here he is with his, you know, servant. There he is with his latest kill. As a young child. I mean, he's he is a, a young guy. There's a great picture. I mean, there's also pictures of the people, so that's one of his yeah, guides wow. or his bearer. I mean, it's it's just this wonderful chronicle of a particular time in a particular place, as well as some pretty, actually exciting hunting scenes. This is my favourite. <laughs> there he is, walking <laughs> with through his a dog. lake with his dog, his rifle just slung Broken. over his shoulder, very ca very <laughs> casual. And it's not just out there. I mean, there's all kinds of, oh, there, there are the dogs again. Um, there's all kinds of crazy looking animals. I mean, the young man with the antelope. There's a leopard just slung over his back. Wow. And then later on, there are pictures of him with his pet leopard that he just keeps at home wow. in his giant sort of Raj mansion, which the civil servants had at that time. But th this is a never repeated period in history. So it's, it's just great to have this, this document. And to see you know, this era of history experienced through one man's mm, own eyes yeah. and how he captured this on camera. So the, the album runs up to 1939 and after that is the war and then the end of the Raj. So it really is the end of an era. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, yeah. the animals are amazing. Look at the duck. Yep, what is this? The morning's bag. Harma, 13th November, 1938. That's a successful day shoot. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, and look at this, I love the decoys. We've <laughs> yes. been doing this since the beginning of time. We have. Putting out the decoys. That's a good decoy, actually. I thought <laughs> yeah. that was real. <laughs> yeah, wow, that is amazing. And then the dogs having the time of their lives. Yeah, the dogs feature a lot in this album. <laughs> like any good Englishman is very That's fond of right. his dogs. Yeah. Oh, incredible. Wow. Yeah. This again is a, a lovely 19th century illustrated book, something that we, we are very happy to deal with. Uh, the Costume of Turkey is mm. in English and French, but again, the main attraction are the plates. So these, I mean, look at these. Wow. Amazing costumes. And again, it, it's the first time that a lot of people in the West would have seen these sorts of, of costumes mm -hmm. in a book like this. So. It was important culturally, but also the, just the beauty of the, yeah. of the plates and the colour. And described, I mean, a Turkish woman, yeah. provincial dress. No dress can possibly be better calculated to conceal the person than that worn by the Turkish females, <laughs> both in Constantinople and the country, whenever they appear abroad. Wow. Then you get, it's in English and French, so this is a, attempting to appeal to as much of Europe as possible, really. Yeah. Amazing, wow. Yeah, so that's 1802, and look at the how the, the plates have survived. Wow, it's amazing. You do get an idea yeah. of Turkey as actually then quite a modern country. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's an interesting... Some, sometimes it's hard to forget, you know, these days how progressive, Yeah. The, you know, the Middle East, yeah, yeah. you know, some areas was at that time. Yeah. Hmm. Wow, that's gorgeous. That's great. What a beautiful, what about this one right here? So this ducks. is... I mean, this is an example actually of 20th century illustrated books, but you can see how it's a tradition that, that's gone on over the centuries because essentially it's very similar to a 19th century. You've got the marbled end papers. You've got great, big, beautiful plates. So this is by um, a bird artist called Philip Rickman who died not that long ago. It's just a collection of his absolutely beautiful wow. um, pictures. There's a long tradition of this kind of bird art in, in sort of British illustration, mm -hmm. and he was a a really super. And how would experiment. these be printed? This is. Well, so, this, this is a print. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a this is a print. Use sort of modern printing processes. Um, What's the date of, uh, from this? So this is nineteen seventy nine. Okay. So yeah, really quite recent. Hmm. Um, now with forward, the forward from the Duke of Edinburgh. The Duke of Edinburgh loved 
wildlife and birds and bird art. So you find him doing the forwards to a lot of these kinds of books. He was a, he was a big supporter of, of this kind of <laughs> yeah. work. I have a weakness for books about birds. There you go. <laughs> and when one is illustrated by Philip Brickman, the grand old man of bird painting, I'm only too delighted to give it a very warm welcome. He actually wrote some books himself in, in this sort of vein, uh, one of which we, we've got his stock, and again, often very nicely bound and beautiful yeah. things. 750 pounds, 750. this is a bargain. It absolutely is. You know, it sure beats the uh, art galleries down on yeah. Ryder Street. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, well, the books world is, is very different from the art world in that respect. You can get something that's really historically significant and beautiful and not have to mortgage your house yeah. for it. It's, uh, well, it's, a, it's a slightly different world. This is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, his paintings are so so lifelike, but sort of dramatic at the same time. They're very good. Wow. Huh. What an incredible kind of collection. I saw one on the shelf I was browsing earlier that I grabbed this beautifully kind of very interestingly bound book yeah. about the race around the world and a lot of family and aviation. And I mean, how beautiful yeah. this is bound. I mean, and this is a book telling an incredible story, mm -hmm. you know, really lost a time. I mean, other than on a, on a shelf in a shop like Southern, exactly. where would you even find this? I mean, these are hard to find in this sort of condition because these early 20th century illustrated bindings, um, I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous, but they've got to be looked after. But this one has been looked after. Mm -hmm. And when you get it in that kind of state, it really adds to the excitement of the story. You feel like the whole thing is one package. I mean, yeah. it is very exciting, early aviation, and done in this beautiful way. Yeah, wow. Wow, incredible. I mean, I really could get lost. I know that, you know, we also have a bunch of really beautiful posters. I mean, what's the story with these? So, I mean, Sutherland has always dealt with, um, you know, printed things for the walls as well as with books. And we have found a real love for travel posters, especially okay. from the, the golden period of travel, mm -hmm. so the 1920s and the 30s, yeah. which is what most of these are. And we deal in first printings. So these are actually posters that will be from 1929 or 1932 uh, that have survived. I mean, sometimes incredibly, very few of them survive and we managed to, to find them. Mm. And um, in great condition, I mean. They're in great condition. We, we only take things that are in really great condition, but they are so popular because they evoke a particular time, mm. a, sort of a kind of when travel was glamorous. Mm. When it wasn't as easy as just getting on an easy jet, you know, yeah. you were going on the Queen Mary or... Yeah. Uh, traveling to ski in Switzerland was a, a real rarity. So yeah. they have that kind of exoticism to them. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we found really popular are luggage labels. Mm. Um, let me grab these. So these would have been pasted onto your luggage at a particular hotel, partly um, to help the porters work out where to send your luggage to, but mm -hmm. also as a, as a souvenir. And we got these from a collection of someone who traveled in that sort of golden period. And where, wherever he went, he would ask for an extra label because he thought they were lovely and they should be kept. And they should be because they yeah. are beautiful. They're little works of art. Um, again, they have that idea of the, you know, the glamor of travel. Yeah, the golden era. And what's interesting is that so many people buy these because they've actually stayed in the hotels. Really? A lot of these are still around. Okay. And you, you get that connection with the past <laughs> again. You know, these are still living and breathing entities, which is lovely. Um, wow. And the, I mean, the little details like the little golf, golf set, the ski, so you get a full idea of what you can get up to at that hotel. I mean, they're, they're great. 18, uh, 1,800 meters. There you elevation. go. That's an important <laughs> important thing to know. Yeah. Um, so that is a really big part of our business, actually, yeah. is, is dealing in that kind yeah. of, I guess, nostalgia. Yeah. But it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And do most of your customers that come into the shop or that you work with, are they sending you specific inquiries or is this really a place that when one is in London to come browse? There's a real mixture. I mean, we have become a destination, especially from um, people from your part of the world yeah. who like to come and just see what we've got and they'll, they'll pick something up and take it away. And we also have sort of dedicated collectors who are after a particular author or a particular subject. And they mm -hmm. come to us specifically for that and we'll find it for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're happy to, to work with anybody in whatever way they like. Some yeah. people just want to buy something beautiful and some people just want to buy something that's, you know, yeah. an intellectual high point. Yeah. And some people want both. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you've got it all. I mean, you know, it's funny uh, over the, 
you know, the years I've been going to Ken Hayes, who's right next door to you, I've, mm. you know, walked past and admired, you know, your work through the window so many times. Lovely. You know, without, um, you know, like, like we're all so guilty of just not taking a few minutes to, you know, pop into the door. Sure. And, uh, and see what kind of lurked beyond, you know, just plain sight. And I have to say, this is absolutely extraordinary, you know, to see all these incredible kind of gems and artifacts and uh, just, you know, all these beautiful representations of quality craftsmanship and tradition, of course, something that's near and dear to my heart. I think this book, I may insist you allow me to purchase. Um, I think I can within, manage that. Within my, my budget, 125 <laughs> pounds, but beautiful. Yeah. And I shall see if I can convince my children to allow me to read it to them. That's uh, a very <laughs> good choice. They'll be enthralled. <laughs> yeah. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you for coming for the in. the tour, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah.